good. Um, which states that uh, full rational CFTs corresponds to um, modular tensor categories that are identified with as the representation category of the VLA together with uh, a so-called special symmetric Frobenius algebra in inside the uh, inside of that modular tensor category. Okay, so um, so that's to say um, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what the full rational CFT actually is, and then. Uh, I'll explain to how to get to a gadget of that shape by starting with this data. And ah, that's where the TQFD techniques come in. So, um, so part one of my talk is uh, just a really brief sketch of CFTs. So, um, so let me give you something that um, is not a definition, but it's meant to give you an idea of what a CFT is. So, scare quote definition. Um, uh, CFT, so a full CFT. I am. Uh, it will take me a little while to get to that point, so let me just tell you right now. Um, CFT comes in different flavors, um, and people tend to not be overly pedantic about which flavor they mean. I'll be a little bit pedantic because for me the distinction is very important. Um, so there's two flavors for now. There's full and chiral. And I'm first going to tell you a bit about full and then how to and then I'll tell you a little bit about chiral. Um, so a full CFT um, is a gadget. I'm just making putting all the scare quotes to make sure that you know that I'm not being precise. Um, which takes as input uh, some primary field content and uh, there are and some operator product expansion between those. And it gives um, these things called correlators. Um, which I'll denote by, I don't know, uh, psi i, psi i2, this is up to psi i n, where these primary fields are set psi i. And um, what are these correlators? Well, they're functions out of the moduli space um, of genus G curves with n mark points into uh, so this for every genus G into C. So there are just some functions on this moduli space. Um, so what is this supposed to supposed to do for you? Well, suppose that you give yourself some uh, some genus G curve. Then you can choose n points on it, 
and decorate those points with, uh, with your fields. And depending on where those points are, you get a number. So you can evaluate this to be a number. Okay, so there are some bunch of functions um, that take as input a bunch of fields, uh, and then you insert those fields at different points and you get a number. Um, the reason this is called conformal is that um, this in particular takes the, the complex structure. So this is the modular space of complex curves. Of complex uh, genus G. With n marked points. Um, marked, um, don't worry about about too much what about but about what that means. Um, it in particular allows you to pick a little disk near roots of the points in a consistent way. But it won't matter much in the, the rest of the explanation. Now um, these are not just random functions, so they satisfy gluing. So um, so if you, you can build uh, lower genus surfaces from higher genus surfaces from lower genus surfaces by um, essentially doing surgery. And um, there are rules for which, for how the correlators for a glued surface are related to the correlators for a non-glued surface. So you can obtain the higher genus correlators from gluing the lower genus. Um, and the other thing is that uh, you're allowed to collide points in a certain way. And um, so that's the other thing. There's a way of colliding points. Um, I realize that this definition will probably make some experts unhappy, um, but I just wanted to give some handle on what these kinds of things are so people can uh, understand the rest of what I'm about to do. Okay, so, so this is a, a full CFT. So in particular, um, these things here are in particular uh, functions of the endpoints. And um, as such, you can ask about, you can factor them into a part that depends holomorphically on those points and a part that depends anti-holomorphically on those points. So you're working over complex curves. So you can factor. Um, uh, into holomorphic. And anti-holomorphic. Um, and now the chiral CFT uh, consists of well, either holomorphic or the anti holomorphic type. So let's just take uh, the a holomorphic part, for example. Uh, 
Okay. So, so far, nothing rigorous has really happened, but are there any questions? So, um, so now uh, it turns out that this, this idea of taking the holomorphic part is a very handy one. And the reason it's handy is that the chiral halves of the CFT, oh, ah, yeah, so Alex is asking what the moduli curve of uh, complex genius, G, modelized space of complex genius G curves is, um, it's simply a space that has a point for each uh, complex structure on your curve. I'm not going to be more precise than that. Um, so, So the, the reason that the chiral CFT is a handy thing to have is that um, is that you can reconstruct it well yeah as we'll see today you can reconstruct a chiral uh, a full CFT from its chiral halves. Um, and the other thing that's handy about chiral CFTs is that they have good formalizations. So, um, the chiral CFTs, um, as, um, so first of all, um, you have um, vertex operator algebras. So the idea here is to, um, to model what happens locally in disks on your, on your surface, so you have your uh, you have your complex curve and you uh, what the vertex operator algebra models is what happens if you bring these points close together so the model uh, model the local behavior and then it turns out that you can by carefully decorating your surface, you can extend that to the whole surface. So, um, and that's a neat way of talking about, uh, about CFTs. And I guess one of the, I mean, there's kind of a long tradition of doing this. So there's a nice book by, uh, by Franco and Ben Slee. Uh, on how to how to do this, um, and then there's a series a series of papers by Huang um, that actually shows that uh, if you do this, you get a bunch of tensor category, which is something that we'll use later on. But it's that's only a very short part of that whole list. Um, another thing, another way in which People have formalized this is uh, by using conformal nets. Um, so these are uh, like sheaves of subfactors, um, and then uh, on the version that I like 
but that is unfortunately problematic in terms of actually finding definitions is weak for chiral Siegel CFTs. Uh, so these are um, functors. out of the borderism category. Uh, and I should maybe say kind of functors, but they're functors with some extra structure. Um, okay, so um, just to repeat, so for today, Uh, what I want to look at is a construction that allows you to take uh, a chiral CFT um, and plus some choices and then uh, from this produce a full CFT. So the idea here is that um, taking this chiral half out of a full CFT is something that you can uh, undo by taking a chiral CFT and making some particular choice. And um, these two constructions are not strictly inverse. There's some uh, legal factor in, in the choices that you're allowed to make. But um, yeah, but so for today, I'm going to be talking about how to how to do that. Okay. Um, how am I doing for time? So that. Okay. Now, um, something that all of these formalizations of chiral CFT have in common. is that you, there's a notion of so-called conformal block in these theories. So, conformal blocks. So, um, so uh, what are these things? Well, they're supposed to contain all the information for the holomorphic parts of the correlators. So the, the way you formalize this mathematically um, is that for, um, for an oriented surface sigma, an oriented Sigma, you get something that I'll denote by H sigma. So this is the vector space of conformal blocks, and um, which is uh, the vector space, or it's a vector space. A uh, vector space of uh, functions uh, oops. So for an oriented surface with n points marked. So you get a vector space of functions um, on uh, the endpoints and um, the possible complex structures. Uh, the position of the endpoints and the complex structures. And these are um, 
multi-valued. So notice that I'm not at all telling you how to get this vector space, um, but this is going to be my first bit of actual input for whatever structures that I'm going to do. So um, what I've done so far um, is just kind of give you an idea of what a CFT is. It's something that assigns to uh, to complex service with service with a bunch of choices of fields at a bunch of points, it assigns a number. You can look at just the holomorphic dependent part of this, um, and that produces for you this particular vector space. And, um, and that's going to be the starting point for, uh, for this reconstruction theorem. Okay, so now, um, given this vector space of conformal blocks, um, there's a useful distinction to make. So, definition of CFT is called rational. If this vector space that you'll just have to believe uh, you can construct um, is finite dimensional. So, uh, for all these surfaces, sigma with all possible numbers of marked points. Okay, so. Um, so if this rationality is a kind of finiteness condition on uh, the kind of objects you're allowed to encounter when you're doing your CFT. And um, I should maybe say this out loud or write this down so, so everybody knows from now on. We're gonna only care about rational. Um, so we're going to put ourselves in a position where, uh, where this particular vector space is always finite dimensional. Um, okay, and now the idea behind the, the FRS construction is that these vector spaces, well, that was not how you write sigma, these vector spaces encode all the all the complex dependence or the or depends on the complex structure and the polymorphicity and such uh, dependence of uh, the CFT. So um, so the idea is that somehow when um, when we picked out the chiral part and did the magic that we needed to do to get this vector space, we dealt with all the complex structure information that we needed to do our CFT. So from this point onwards, um, all you need to care about is, uh, is the topology. So in particular, the assignment that takes sigma and takes it to H sigma, it only cares about uh, about the topology. Uh, and is and we still have this idea that it should be compatible with the gluing. That it's compatible. So um, soon I'll have a better way of saying what this compatibility with gluing actually means. Um, 
but the takeaway message from, from the first part of the story is that a CFT is this uh, kind of complicated gadget that uses complex structure and things like this. Um, and you can split off this complex structure dependence into this chiral CFT part. And then um, to get a full CFT, I, I'll show you that you only really need to care about these vector spaces, which depend topologically on, on the surface that you, uh, that you do them for, um, and some other topological information. Okay, so, um, and that's where topological quantum field theory comes in. So let me tell you a bit about GQFTs. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so um, so the next part of my talk uh, is DQFTs. And um, so maybe if you, uh, if you were either already an expert in CFTs and don't know about DQFTs, or um, if you, uh, if you just don't care about CFT so much, um, I'll start kind of start over now and just tell you a bit about generic TQFTs before starting to specify the things that I actually need. So, um, so if this was a talk on TQFTs, I would now be starting my whole historical overview of TQFTs and um, the general. Uh, stuff that people like to say when they talk about GQFTs. I'll skip over that for today, um, but you know, ask me anytime and I'll be happy to, uh, to give you some more background. Let me just start from the point of view that um, if CFT, CFTs were simple, um, GQFTs are even simpler uh, versions of quantum field theories, and uh, we have a nice workable mathematical definition for them. So let me write down that definition. So an oriented DQFT, uh, so when you work with something that has an abbreviation, there's always the risk that you forget to tell people what it stands for. So DQFT stands for topological quantum field theory. And that's the last time that I'll say that out loud, I think. Um, so an oriented TQFT is a symmetric monoidal uh, functor which has a, as its domain a category of oriented cobordisms um, in dimension d, d minus one, down to d minus k. Um, and I told you that it needs to be a symmetric monoidal functor. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with symmetric monoidal categories, uh, a monoidal category is a category with a kind of tensor product, so it allows you to combine objects. Uh, multiply objects and uh, symmetric just means that the order in which you do this doesn't matter. Um, the example that you need to keep in mind for today is the category of vector spaces. So that has a tensor product, allows you to take the tensor product of two vector spaces, this is symmetric. Um, and the other example that we'll be using is this bordism category, which comes equipped with a disjoint union. So if you have um, two objects in here, which are closed, so compact without boundary, oriented uh, d minus k manifolds. If you have two of those, um, you can take a disjoint union 
to get another one, and it doesn't matter which order you do this. Um, so it's a semantic one of functor. So its domain is this Bordism category that I'll work out a bit further later. But let me first just finish um, the functor. Um, it's usually denoted by Z for historical reasons. And it takes values in, um, in something C that is uh, uh, an infinity K uh, symmetric monoidal monoidal infinity K category. Now, um, that sounds scary, and I need a little bit of this infinity uh, generality. But the main examples I'll be using today um, are for k very small. So the examples I'll be needing today are uh, the category of vector spaces over the complex numbers. So this is a k equals uh, one example. Then I'll need the category of algebras, bimodules, and intertwiners uh, in vector spaces. So this is a k equals two example. Um, and then the only other example that I'll introduce now is the category of linear categories. The category of linear categories, which I guess for this audience is the most familiar after the category of vector spaces. Um, okay, so let me finish my, my explanation of what the Cordism category is. So I'm just introducing it right away as a higher category. Um, so the, the one morphisms are um, D minus K plus one dimensional uh, oriented cobordisms. So um, if you have a D minus K closed manifold M and a D minus K dimensional closed manifold M, uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a d minus k dimensional uh, the w a d minus k plus one dimensional uh, manifold and uh, w has a boundary which is identified with the disjoint union of m and n so. Um, I guess the picture is just this. So you have, uh, for example, this. So you have uh, M living on one boundary, N living as the other boundary, and then W is the thing sitting in the middle. Now, um, to get a, a K category or an infinity K category, you uh, now just keep going. So you allow yourself uh, D minus K plus two um, dimensional cobordisms uh, between these cobordisms. And then you just keep going. Um, and then finally, um, you make this into an infinity category by uh, at the top level and reaching. Oh, ah, Josh is asking. Oh, sorry, asked this. Oh, never mind. Um, yeah, so um, at the uh, so at the D level, uh, at the D morphism level, you have uh, D dimensional. Cobordisms, and then from there on, you have diffeomorphisms and uh, isotopies, and, and so on. And isotopies between isotopies and things like this. Okay, so 
Um, I realize that's quite a bit to take in. So uh, what's the idea here? Um, so the idea here is that you specify what the, the what the largest dimensional manifold is that you're going to encounter in your PQFT. That's this uh, dimension D, and um, because this is a um, and then if you take a closed d-dimensional manifold, you can view it as a cobordism between the empty d minus one dimensional manifold and uh, the empty d minus one dimensional manifold. So it's an endomorphism of that thing. So if you trace that through, it means that you're looking at an endomorphism of an endomorphism of an endomorphism of um, the unit object on this side. So if you plug in something here, like vector spaces, so endomorphisms of the unit, so the unit in vector spaces is the complex numbers, it's the thing that does nothing when you tensor with it. Um, the endomorphisms of this is just a copy of C. So in that case, you assign the complex number to, uh, to a top dimensional manifold. And um, yeah, so, and then, so you decide, decide what, to what dimension you want to assign numbers, and then you decide to how, to what, to what extent you allow yourself to cut your manifolds into bits. So, uh, I guess if you give yourself, for example, a torus, um, you can cut it into, uh, into pairs of pants by, and just choosing a bunch of arcs. And then you might still want to cut a bit further, so you might also want to have these circles cut into lines, so then you need to choose points and lines. And then you get some kind of cutting system on your, uh, on your torus. And, um, and the, the further you're allowed to cut somehow, um, the easier the pieces are that you get to work with, but the more complicated the, the topological proof theory actually becomes. Yeah. Okay, but um, to step away from all of this uh, abstract stuff, let's quickly do an example. Um, so, So um, let's do an example for k equals one and uh, d equals one. So this is a one dimensional topological quantum field theory. So what we get is a map out of the oriented bordism category with one manifolds and zero manifolds into, and I'll choose as my target, just vector spaces over C. Now, um, you need to equip your points with orientations. And it turns out that one way of thinking about this is that you can have two different orientations. And I mean, it's a functor, so it better take a point to a vector space. And it turns out that um, the opposite, the oriented point, then has to go to the, um, to the dual vector space. And why is that the case? Well, there's a bunch of elementary cobordisms that you can do. And one is this elbow, which combines um, the plus point and the minus point and uh, makes a cobordism into, into the empty set. On this side, you have the empty set. Now, I did this in my notes, but I forgot to do it on the board. Um, the empty set is actually sent to the uh, to the complex numbers. Why is that the case? Well, remember that we're using disjoint union as the monoidal structure on this bordism category. So disjoint unioning with the empty set doesn't do anything. So uh, the empty set is the neutral element for, for the disjoint union. So it better be sent to the neutral 
to the unit polynomial structure on this side, and uh, that's C. So the empty set is set to C. So um, this thing here is um, is a morphism, and so far this is just using that it, that our TQFT is a symmetric monopole functor. So uh, so this cobordism here gets sent to a morphism from V tensor V dual into C. Um, and this is, and it turns out um, that this thing here is non-degenerate. And um, the reason that's the case is, and that's a bit too long of an exercise to do right now, um, but that's if you take this cobordism here, so um, you end in, uh, ooh, doo -doo. Um, for example, oh, I, I drew it the wrong way around. Anyway, um, uh, so if you start with plus and with plus, um, and this cobordism here is diffeomorphic to just a straight line. And if you run through what that means for this pairing, you figure out that it means that that has to be not degenerate. Um, okay. Now, uh, the other example, which is also for k equals one, um, but d now equals two. So, functors out of the Bordism category with orientations into vector spaces. Um, so notice the pattern of, uh, of, of things happening here. So what I'm essentially doing when I'm describing this, this functor is that I'm writing down a bunch of objects in the Bordism category that generate the rest of the objects using this joint union. And, um, and then there's a bunch of morphisms uh, that generate all the morphisms, and then I just need to assign appropriate values to those things, and that defines my TQFT. Now, the, um, the oriented two-dimensional once extended board is in the category, so board to one, has exactly one interesting generating object, which is the circle as one. And so we need to send that to some algebra, or to some vector space A. And it turns out that that vector space is actually going to be algebra. So um, so if you look at the this particular bordism, the pair of pants bordism, uh, which merges two circles into one, it will become a map from A tensor A to A. And you can check that this gives an algebra structure. So that, that, is it, that it is actually an algebra structure is a consequence of uh, more relations like this one. Just not going to unpack that. Um, so all in all, um, what you find here is like one of the famous first theorems about TQFTs is that um, these kinds of um, k equals two, oh, sorry, k equals one, d equals two oriented TQFTs, they correspond one to one uh, to so called um, commutative for Vignes algebras. So, um, ah. similar to group. Sorry, I don't understand the, the chat. I got it. Like, okay, great. Uh, okay, so, um, 
yeah, so the so it turns out that, the, and this is like a really old theorem, it turns out that you can classify these uh, two dimensional field theories as commutative continuous algebras. Now, in the world of TQFTs, um, there's another really successful uh, classification result, which is known as the Comportism hypothesis. Uh, um, and so what this says is that, um, so first of all, this is, there's a sketch uh, of a proof due to Nuri. Um, there's a bit of an annoyance that uh, nobody has worked out this sketch. It's widely believed to be, um, to be fine. Uh, but there are some details to be working out and people are working on this. And until that, whenever you say Kapoorism hypothesis, you have to say disclaimer. Okay. Um, so what this says is that if you take um, symmetric monoidal functors, so TQFTs, on the Bordism category, um, now with framing instead of orientation, don't worry if you don't know what it means, I'll kind of I just want to give you kind of interview, an overview. Um, on the Bordism category, that starts with D-dimension manifolds and goes all the way down to zero. So you, this is a requirement for the Bordism hypothesis. Uh, with values in some, um, well, this is now with infinity D category C. Um, turns out that this category is equivalent to the category of, to, or to the full subgroup, full groupoid of uh, fully dualizable objects in C. Um, so that's to say that somehow this pattern here where um, you, you figured out that the TQFT is determined by a vector space together with a dual, it continues up. Um, and it turns out that, you know, you can kind of, you can already imagine that if you now also have two dimensional cohortisms, and you form uh, this cobordism, um, you can build a cobordism from this circle to the empty set just by doing a disk. And that expresses some adjunctability, and that's what this fully dualizability is supposed to encode. Um, so, um, so regardless of whether you're uh, comfortable with framings or this fully realizable part, the take the message here is that um, we have control over what fully extended field theories do. And it's not just with framing. Um, if we, uh, what, what's additionally shown is that if you do this for uh, things with orientations, values in C, um, and this then corresponds to taking this fully dualizable part of C, which carries a natural action of the, uh, of the group SO, and you take it to a multiple fixed points. So that is to say that um, Modulo computing is on multiple fixed point stuff, which can be genuinely hard. Um, we don't we know what fully extended field theories look like, um, also with orientation. And I could have put any tangent group here, and I would have just taken a corresponding multiple fixed point there. So we have a lot of control over extended field theories. Uh, and as an example of this, um, which will also be relevant later on. Uh, there's a theorem um, which doesn't rely on this result, but is an instant, but is still an instant of this, and it's due to Christian or Priest. That's saying that um, these functors out of the Bordism category now 
for two-dimensional manifolds, one-dimensional manifolds, and zero-dimensional manifolds and orientations with values in this category algebect, so the category of algebra objects in vector spaces, so algebra as a vector spaces, with morphisms by modules between those, and then as two morphisms intertwiners, so by module maps. Um, so if you look at those, those correspond to, um, or that's equivalent to the full sub to the full sub subcategory uh, or full subgroup right on so-called uh, separable symmetric Frobenius algebras. Um, so the main reason I'm telling you this is that uh, this should sound familiar from the start of my talk. So the, this is quite close to the kinds of objects that you encounter in this FRS construction I'm trying to tell you about. Um, separability is just ordinary separability for an algebra. So it means that you're uh, projective in your category of bimodules. Uh, symmetric is a condition that only makes sense for Frobenius algebras. Frobenius algebras are self-dual algebras, and it means that the self-duality is compatible with the, uh, with the multiplication in a good way. Anyway, um, so those are a bunch of examples and, and things. So now uh, it's time to start getting back to um, to the FRS construction and, um, and what are tensor categories and CFDs and such. Uh, and so let me introduce that. So let me introduce the main connection between these. Any questions, by the way? No? Suspicious. Okay, so, um, so back towards the, uh, towards CFTs. Uh, so there's another classification result um, due to uh, Bartlett, Douglas, Shamar Priest, and Vickery, which says that if you look at these TQFTs now on the Bordism category in three dimensions uh, extended down to one manifold with orientation, uh, with values in the category of linear categories, um, you can map these to the category of uh, modular tensor categories. where this map here is the map that takes uh, a T Q of T and evaluates it on the circle. And that's the same trick that I did for the classification of the two dimensional ones. Um, so you just evaluate it on the, on the generating object here. And so what they show is that whenever you have such a T Q of T, uh, you get a, a modular tensor category. Um, I need to quickly fix something. So these are called these are so-called anomaly-free uh, modular tensor categories. For those of you who are experts, um, I didn't want to lie. Uh, for those of you that are not experts, forget about it. Um, okay. So what they show is that if you have such a functor. Um, the value on the circle has the structure of a modular tensor category. Conversely, if you have a modular tensor category, you can build a functor like this. Um, and so why is this, does this help in getting towards the, um, towards, uh, <clears throat> towards CFT? Well, 
when there's this when there's this theorem um, due to Wang, um, which says that uh, for um, it just I'm just going to call it a nice uh, for a nice vertex operator algebra. Um, the delta node by for E V. Uh, the category rep V is a uh, moderate tensor category. So, so uh, notice that I'm saving myself the arduous task of explaining to you what a moderate tensor category is. Um, it's a graded fusion category with a non-degenerate grading and some more stuff. Um, but uh, the important part for us is that these things are in particular, can in particular occur as representation categories of vertex operator algebras. So, um, so what we'll do, and this, this is the starting point of the FRS construction, is that we can now assume we will now assume that rational chiral CFTs uh, give rise to uh, uh, to a TQFT. By uh, uh, by the above. Okay, so um, so the connection between this world of uh, of topological field theories and uh, and conformal field theories is that if you give yourself a chiral CFT, it naturally comes with a three dimensional topological quantum field theory. Okay, so now, um, now the goal for the remainder of the talk is to use TQFT methods to uh, go from chiral to full. Okay, so um, so I obviously don't have time to give you all of the. Ah. Is there any topological reason between the non-degeneracy of the braidings? Uh, yeah. So, um, so, unfortunately, yeah, it's a very good question to ask. Um, unfortunately. Um, the full explanation is a bit hard to give, um, but the short reason is that the um, is that the way the mapping class group acts in the TQFT. Oh, so the hmm, I need to choose where to start this. Uh, Yes, give me a second. Right. Okay. So let's let's first let's first say this. So uh, there is an explicit relation in the three-dimensional bordism category that tells you that the only part of the modular tensor category that is allowed to braid trivially with everything else is the image of the unitor. So is everything spanned by the unit of the modular tensor category? There's actually a, a topological expression of that condition. And that's, that's just, that's the best way of saying this. And then in more traditional terms, um, what the three dimensional field theories are supposed to do, and why modular tensor categories are called modular tensor categories, um, 
is that they are supposed to produce a vector space together with an action of the mapping class group of the torus as the value of the torus. And if you look at what the generators for the mapping class group of the torus are, one of them is expressed through the grading. And for, in order for that action to be uh, invertible, so to act by an invertible element, you need this moment generalism as well. That's the, the classical way of thinking. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, probably, uh, <coughs> sorry. So like you said, you also built in uh, like uh, uh, different morphisms and uh, isotopies in this bot bodism uh, category also. Probably okay. that's the reason. So there's a little bit of a dirty trick, well, not even that dirty. Uh, so linear mm -hmm. is just a, it's just a two category. It doesn't have any higher morphisms beyond. Uh, yeah. So you also so on the subdomain, the Buddhism category, you can also, uh, uh, I mean, so you want to put in all these different morphisms and isotopies to so these mapping class groups or? By considering, oh, sorry. Ah, I see what you're asking. Um, so the, the mapping class group elements yeah. are implemented in this three to one Buddhism category as the uh, mapping cylinders of the different morphisms. Yeah. So there's a, there's a three dimensional. So you get the action of, yeah. Uh -huh. And so you get this uh, SL2, SL2, the acting on the torus. And, uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, good questions. Um, right, so, uh, so in order to start off the FRS construction, I need uh, uh, another fact, which is that which is that correlators in, uh, in full CFT uh, can be written, so they, um, there, there are actually elements of, um, this vector space that we associated to the surface tensored with uh, with the dual of that vector space. Um, so correlated for school safety on the sigma, where I'm hiding a bunch of points as well in that sigma. Um, so correlators in the school safety they correspond to elements of the um, I should write a uh, complex conjugate vector space here. So they correspond to the elements of this conformal block tensored with its dual vector space. And, um, and that's just a, a classical result from, from conformal field theory factorization. Um, but what this, uh, so, um, okay, so that, that, that's one thing but we're not allowed to just pick any old element. You still need compatibility with the gluing. So, uh, so with compatibility, compatibility with gluing. So if you pick, uh, if you pick some elements for parts of the surface, you then glue the surface together from those parts you're only allowed to pick the elements that you get under the canonical gluing. So there's, um, so if you want to build a full CFT out of, it, out of chiral parts, you're faced with the problem of solving these constraints. And the thing that FRS does for you is that it solves these constraints for you in a very elegant manner by using TQFT management methods. So, um, so before I go on, so let me just replace elements of um, instead by a map out of the complex numbers. So uh, elements of a vector space are equivalently uh, maps out of complex numbers. Uh, and I'll denote the map by tau sub sigma. So we get for each Sigma, we get this map tau sub sigma from the complex numbers into this tensor product. 
and um, and those maps need to then be compatible to gluing. So let me give you a schematic for uh, what that means in terms of organism categories. <clears throat> what am I doing for time? Not great. Okay, so um, yeah. So before I start writing, I should tell you about this thing. Um, so whenever you consider functors out of a bordism category into symmetric monoidal functors out of a bordism category into some uh, symmetric monoidal category, there's always an obvious existing such functor, which is the functor that just takes uh, all objects to uh, to the unit object of the target category, takes all morphisms to the identity morphisms on that unit, and takes all higher morphisms to the higher identity morphisms on that identity morphism, and so on and so forth. And this thing is called the trivial field theory, and I will denote it by one. So you have one from a bordism category into whatever C, and it just takes uh, an object here to one of C, and then uh, a morphism C to D, it just takes uh, the identity on one C. Okay. Um, and we can now use this thing to model this kind of uh, to this kind of model this kind of thing where you're uh, choosing a map out of C into a tensor point. So, um, so let's see. So, I'll start with um, my bordism category in uh, three, two, one dimensions. This is values in the category of linear categories. And um, I can now form, uh, so uh, I didn't introduce this notation, that's a bit annoying. So, um, ah, sorry. Um, okay. So let me denote by H, the TQ of T, so H is the TQ of T associated to the chiral C of T. I was meaning to introduce that into the notation earlier, but I forgot. So, um, so H is the TQ of T associated to the chiral C of T. So in particular, it assigns to a certain sigma which is an object in here, um, it assigns uh, the vector space, the morphism spaces in here, are vector spaces. And I can now form um, the tensor product of that TQ of T with its dual. And this is really just saying um, take the pointwise product of these two. Um, where uh, h over bar is just the TQT you get by applying the dual as it were. Um, and similar, well, with less introduction, you also have the, uh, the unit field theory. And what you want to do um, is you want to pick for each surface, you want to pick a map from one to the other. Um, and you want to do this for each surface and not for each three manifold. So instead of looking at the bordism uh, category in three to one dimensions, I'll look at the bordism category um, in two and one dimensions to get our orientations. Um, and there's a map from this bordism category into this one um, where we do remember diffeomorphisms here and send them to map instead of this. Okay. 
So the, the, the objects just go to the corresponding object, the surfaces go to the corresponding surfaces, and then if you have a diffeomorphism between surfaces, which is a, uh, a two morphism here, you send it to its corresponding method. This allows you to pull back both of these field theories to field theories on this bordism category. And you can now look for, uh, for natural transformations tau like this. And uh, what this does for you is that it exactly encodes the gluing. Um, so it encodes the gluing. So um, if you take, so I mean, this is, so tau is now a, a natural transformation. Um, so in particular, it sends, um, in particular, you have the tau of uh, disjoint union, or sorry, the union along a boundary of two things. Um, that is the, uh, the glue of um, the glue of the two just comes from naturality. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is that you can encode this compatibility with the gluing in this TQP manner by just realizing that if you write down, uh, if you try to find um, natural transformations between these functors, uh, you automatically get this. But there's a little bit of a trickiness that goes on here. Um, there's kind of two things. First of all, I need this to be a lax natural transformation. Uh, otherwise, there is nothing that you can do. Um, and the only maps you can build are isomorphisms. Uh, it's just a fact about boys and categories. And uh, so it's worthwhile capturing that into a definition. So uh, twisted uh, TQT is a max natural uh, where you take some bordism category in dimension D down to dimension D minus K with two maps, uh, a Z and a Z prime, a Z prime and a Z into some C where this is now a K plus one category. Um, and you ask for a lecture transformation like this. Um, I'm running a little bit low on time, so I think I will kind of leave this twist stuff hanging a little bit and, and move on. So there, the nice thing about these twisted PQTs is they, um, they're really general, like they're more general than, than this, but they particular, they model defects between quantum field theories and they model boundaries of quantum field theories, topological quantum field theories. Um, and I wanted to explain that as well, but I think I should move on to applying this the rest construction rather than explaining that. But feel free to ask me afterwards. Um, okay. Now, um, I'll leave this up. So now, it turns out that um, you need a little bit more than just this lax natural transformation uh, to be able to do everything you want to do in a, in a, in a, in a CFT. Um, so the problem here is that 
this border zone category is not uh, is called local. So, um, so that means that we don't so no uh, assignment uh, to points. And uh, if you have a full safety, it does have an assignment to a point. So uh, this here is locality. So um, we seem to be at a little bit of an impasse because um, everything we've done so far um, just involved things on the non-extended borders in category. And we want to do something on the extended borders in category. But fortunately, uh, this is something we can do. So we can do this thing, which is called extending. So we can extend. Uh, the field theory given by H tensor H bar to um, to a field theory on the fully extended borders in category. So um, three to zero oriented. Now with values in, um, in the category that I'm going to choose here is the category of Tensor categories, um, TC, um, and I'll introduce this in the shortest way possible, which is by saying that it's the category of algebra objects in linear categories. So its objects are um, monoidal linear categories, also known as tensor categories. Its morphisms are bimodules for those categories. Um, its two morphisms are functors that preserve the bimodular structure. And then finally, uh, you have natural transformations at the top level. And that makes this into three categories. And you can consider, um, you, consider you can consider TQFTs like this. And, and there's a theorem that tells you that it's enough to specify where, uh, where the plus-oriented point goes. And you can send it to, um, M, where this is the MTC associated to in the field theory H. Um, okay. Um, so if I call this field theory uh, Z, um, the reason that this is called an extension is that uh, I think this is uh, such that. Well, this has the feature that if you take um, Z of S1, uh, that exactly gives you back M box and bar. Um, so I'm skipping over quite a lot of uh, known maths here. So this is a theorem from Grinfeld uh, that you can build these field theories as a theorem from uh, Bartels, Douglas, and uh, Shamar Priest. Um, anyway, uh, so this allows you to instead use this fully extended borders in category, and then just to finish up. Uh, so I can replace uh, this board is in category by the fully extended one. Um, this field theory by uh, by this field theory Z, and then I'm looking at twists on the oriented board is an oriented fully extended board is in category between one and Z. So, uh, so I E. Uh, full CFT corresponds to twists um, between 
on the two the two dimensional for the extended borders and category orientations with values in uh, this category of tensor categories between the trivial uh, at the trivial TQ of T and TQ of TZ going down to N. Now um, it turns out that by work of Scheinbauer and Johnson Fried, these are the same as um, as adjunctable, left adjunctable. Uh, Vect and module categories. And then again, by further work um, that I still, by further work, um, these are then uh, special symmetric for various algebras. Um, so effectively, uh, what we've done is we've uh, reduced this idea and reduced this uh, construction of these school CFTs to finding all the possible twists between uh, this particular fully extended field theory and, uh, and the trivial field theory. And then all you need to do is compute what these are and I claim that they're special symmetric for doing this algebra. That's uh, exactly what the uh, uh, FRS construction tells you should happen. So the upshot is that you can get a full CFT uh, by doing uh, so a chiral CFT, so an MTC, which comes from a VOA. Uh, together with a special symmetric Fermi's algebra object in this MTC um, and a special symmetric Fermi's algebra. Okay, and I think I should stop there. Oh. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, do you have any questions? Josh, for example, or Makoto? Uh, so uh, about that, sort of one of the last points you made, uh, so you have so this description of uh, uh, full CFT and uh, twists uh, between these. Uh, I mean, uh, so and then so going all the way down. So you have a description with module categories uh, between vect and m, but doesn't it impose some uh, restriction on uh, which m you can have? Like it looks like you end up having integral dimension function on m. Right. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I realized that the last bit was a little bit rushed. So M is supposed to be the modular tensor category associated to the chiral CFT. So you, you um, so if you have a modular tensor category, uh, there's a theorem that tells you that the general center of that modular tensor category, just taken as just a monoidal category, uh, is equivalent to... Uh, yeah, yeah, so mu less zero. Yeah, so, so that it in particular implies that you can build a fully extended field theory with values in the category of tensor categories that assigns to the point exactly just the underlying fusion category of M rather than the, the modular tensor category with all its gradients. And um, the reason that works is that what <coughs> fully extended theory assigns to the circle is exactly the Drinfeld center. Of whatever you assign to the point. Yeah. So, but still, I mean, so I I don't see where the vect can appear uh, in this queue. Oh, um, vect. So vect is just a unit in tensor categories. 
uh, is here. It's the monoidal unit. So if you look at twists from the trivial theory into, into M. Oh, into sorry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, so you don't assume something like invertible bimodular condition here. No, no. It's, it's a, 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 um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an unconjunctibility. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any other questions? Okay, so I maybe have a, oh, yeah, you said? No, so Thomas, you want to say something about the facts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'd like to hear, yeah. So the, the thing that I skipped over is that, um, so if you have one of these twisted field theories, um, which is of this form, so it, it's uh, of the form that you, you take a field theory, yep. you restrict it to a field theory in one dimension lower, and then you look at twists uh, on those, those you can interpret as defects for that field theory, uh, in between mm. those field theories. Yeah, okay. The reason for this is that um, you now know how to assign. So if you have a top dimensional manifold, say, and you divide it into two bits, the bit along which you divide is a, uh, a co-dimension one sub-manifold. And you now know how to assign to that co-dimensional one sub-manifold a morphism from uh, whatever the field theory on the top assigns to that boundary to whatever the field theory in the, back, the bottom assigns to that boundary. Yeah, okay. Mm. And now you can evaluate the whole thing to make your CD defect. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other question? So also I got a small question, like maybe it's too big, I don't know. Uh, but just like, uh, I mean, like, like uh, I'm not really like an expert in this at all, like in any sense. Just I, I hear like quite often like, uh, I mean like that, okay, like uh, it's really hard to uh, construct uh, quantum field theory, like uh, with interaction or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, is it like topological quantum field theory? Is it something related to like trying to find like a non-trivial example? Mm. Um, and in my view, um, the way this works is that um, you can always, if you're a physicist, compute things out of acuity. Um, and then as a mathematician, okay. And then as a mathematician, your, your task is to come up with a mathematical formalism that reproduces those computations in some way and is completely like, rigorously defined. So like, uh, like trying to, um, like, like mathematically uh, handle like singularities and like these things like, uh, yeah, kind of like infrared and like uh, ultraviolet. Yeah, so you get, you get to kind of also choose how far, how far along the physical way of looking at it you actually go. So what what a TQFT does is it models um, physical theories in which uh, the theory you put in does not depend on the metric. That's what what oh. I can say. Okay. It turns out that in those cases, you can just kind of effectively describe the TQFT, the, the quantum field theory in this way, where you just say, well, I assign something to top dimensional manifolds and lower dimensional and so on and so forth. And that's an effective description of the kind of outcomes you get by running your physical QFT. But what it does not do, and explicitly does not do, is formalize the way physicists think about this QFT. Like it, it's not an attempt at dealing with renormalization or whatever. Like it, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of capturing the outcomes of what the physicists have done in an effective way. And uh, CFT is a bit closer to, it's a lot closer actually to QFT in that sense where we actually have lots of mathematical defi we have def mathematical definitions for lots of objects that occur in the way physicists think about CFTs and can do the things with them that physicists say you can do with them. 
which is why CFT is also really cool to mathematicians. Okay. Um, so that's Thank you, Thomas, for this very, very nice talk. Let's thank the uh, speaker again. Yeah. And uh, next week, um, so next week, Richard, I think you mentioned that you... So that Valerio is talking. Valerio. Valerio, yes, Valerio Proietti. Yeah. He didn't send the title yet, but it's going to be, well, something related to the cap conjecture. So, uh, cap conjecture, which says something about um, well, if you know see something about it, so you have an action of uh, say Z D on uh, Cantor Z minimal action. You look at the cross product algebra and you ask about the values of trace on projections in the cross product. And gap, gap conjecture, it's still conjecture, which have, there are three published proofs, by the way, but it's still conjecture. And uh, it describes a set of values of, uh, of a trace. So okay. that's for next week. Great. Okay. Um, and, Thomas, and so see you next week. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks for coming also. And thanks for giving your talk. Bye. Bye.